Hello, Betty. What's the problem? I haven't got a problem. I've got problems. Plural. Wanna hear? Sure. Abnormalities have been found in fir trees near the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. Japan's Environment Ministry has been observing about 80 species of wild animals and trees near the plant since 2011. That's the year Japan suffered its worst nuclear accident. At the ministry's request, the National Institute of Radiological Sciences analyzed fir trees in areas where radiation levels are relatively high. The results were published on Friday. They show that Japanese fir populations near the plant showed a significantly increased number of morphological defects. These include deletions of leader shoots of the main branch axis. The study shows that 98% of fir trees in a 3.5-kilometer area from the damaged plant have such defects. The radiation dose there is about 34 microsieverts per hour. The institute says the results indicate that radioactive materials emitted during the nuclear accident may have caused such abnormalities. Duh. The institute's Satoshi Yoshida says conifers such as fir trees are more susceptible to radiation, but he says further studies are necessary. Relations between such defects and radiation are still unclear. Did somebody write stupid on my forehead and I didn't notice it? The Environment Ministry says no abnormalities have so far been confirmed in other animals or trees. Here's where it gets crazy. People cleaning up the fallout from the Fukushima nuclear accident have begun a new phase of their work. They started full-scale decontamination in a town that received the highest levels of radioactivity. About 30 workers gathered at an elementary school in the town of Okuma. They removed topsoil from the playground. The government says the area will be off limits for a long time. It's laughable and troubling, both combined. The Environment Ministry launched full-scale decontamination at the request of local authorities. The local authorities have designated this district as a hub for reconstruction. <laughs> So we're going to carry out a full-scale cleanup to help them. I mean, what the hell is wrong with these people? And if they're here at Walmart, where are their kids? <laughs> oh, of course. Ministry officials plan to finish decontaminating about 95 hectares by next March. In the remote West Texas desert outside of a small town called Andrews, highly radioactive waste from nuclear power plants is being dumped into a deep hole in the ground. The waste, coming from 36 states across the U.S., will be dumped into a site that sits right on top of the Ogallala Aquifer, the world's second largest aquifer, providing water to 27 percent of the entire agricultural land in the United States. If this toxic nuclear waste ever leaks into the groundwater, it could affect the water supply of nearly a third of U.S. farmland. The nuclear waste dump, owned by waste control specialists, was built by Harold C. Simmons, a top contributor to prominent Republicans such as former President George W. Bush and former Texas Governor Rick Perry. Its critics say this waste disposal plan is the privatization of nuclear waste management and not only a subsidy to billionaires but will pose a grave environmental risk and also fear the company cannot be trusted to manage such a toxic environmental threat. Well, to discuss why this is such a dangerous operation, I am joined now by investigative journalist Paul DiRienzo for an exclusive interview. Paul, uh, your article on this hasn't even uh, been released yet, but you found uh, that the state of Texas granted waste control specialists a license only after aggressive lobbying by Republican contributor Harold C. Simmons, whom I mentioned, uh, and that there wasn't enough studies done to uh, study the effects of this really first. What exactly did you find here? Well, uh, what we discovered was that uh, the site waste control uh, specialists, which is a nuclear waste dump that's been constructed over the last few years uh, in West Texas, um, 
was supposed to be far from any water supply, and yet it would turn out later after uh, one of the members of the Texas uh, commission that was supposed to study the and grant the license for this uh, that in fact it was within 14 feet of a water table and 14 feet of that aquifer and uh, the clay substance which was supposed to be water impermeable was in fact filled with fissures and cracks that allowed the water to migrate through it and that in fact um, WCS also admitted that there was um, uh, water coming into numerous test wells that were drilled around the site. So the area that was supposed to be dry was in fact wet. And uh, the license was granted on the uh, initial uh, idea that this was uh, isolated and far from, this, uh, from access to this aquifer. Well, you also found that this waste management company, uh, WCS, has a terrible safety record. Can you expand a little bit on it? Well, I, I don't know if they so much have a terrible safety record, although there was a problem 40 miles away where waste barrels stored at the waste isolation pilot plant, which is a government facility, uh, had what the Department of Energy called a, uh, a, an event, which amounted to an explosion of one of the barrels that uh, spewed plutonium dust into the site and out into the atmosphere where it was uh, detected miles away. Um, over 100 barrels of the similar nuclear waste that came from, it was actually defense waste, transuranic containing elements beyond uranium, including plutonium. It had been, uh, uh, had come originally from, it was low level waste, they call which doesn't really mean it's low level, it just means the type of source, it's pretty much nothing else or everything else that isn't uh, called something else. Um, anyway, this uh, waste, these waste barrels were shipped uh, after the explosion closed the waste control specialist site, they had to be shipped to a new site because they were sitting there and they were shipped to this uh, WCS site uh, 40 miles away in Texas where there is, according to Freedom of Information Act files that I was able to get, uh, there is no adequate safety uh, process that I exists that could be used in case uh, more of these barrels exploded. I mean, these barrels were, were uh, packed with kitty litter and the kitty litter that was used to pack them uh, turned out to be different than was supposed to be used and caused an explosion or what they called an event mm. or a thermal event that heated up to 1600 degrees and allowed radiation to spew everywhere so the question is what are they going to do now that 109 barrels of this waste has been shipped in this emergency circumstance and situation to waste control specialists mm. now how waste control specialists got its license is yet another issue because once these barrels were delivered, folks started to study and to learn more about this site. And, it would dis and they discovered that local community residents, even though it's a very conservative pro-business area in, in Nuclear Alley where there's other nuclear facilities, had actually protested against this site and attempted to stop the site from being built. However, there, they were, uh, when Mr. Simmons bought the company, he immediately, uh, supporters of the site began to show up at mm -hmm. city meetings, at county meetings, and mm -hmm. began to make threats and direct threats against the business people in the town and against the lead activists who themselves were blue-collar people, uh, oil roughnecks, children of oil roughnecks from the area, it's an oil producing area, who had begged and asked for the, uh, st the, uh, the, the state to not, give, not grant these, uh, uh, these permits to allow more and more nuclear waste. And in fact, Texas had originally been in a compact with the state of Vermont that there were two states that would, Texas and Vermont, that would dump their waste at WCS. Now, Paul, rules I, and laws have been bent and changed that 36 states are now sending their uh, toxic waste. And now, WCS is requesting even further licensing that would allow more and more uh, nuclear waste from nuclear power plants and other sources to be brought and put there into this site. So now we're seeing that WCS Paul, has Paul, I have to jump in, morphed. unfortunately. Unfortunately, we're, we're very short on time. We're pretty much out of time. But... Uh, there's so much to say. Where can people read your piece since we since we did have to cut this so short? And when? Sure. www.whowhatwhy.org, and it will be uh, published on Monday. Investigative journalist Paul DiRenzo, thank you so much for your time. I wish thank we had you. more of it. Sure.
Japan has restarted their first nuclear reactor to generate electricity since 2013. And that's really bad news. Remember what happened in 2013? Why Japan closed all of its reactors abruptly? Why we're still tracing the spread, the plume of radioactive material across our Pacific coast and into the atmosphere? I mean, first there was the earthquake that did significant damage to that island country, and then a tsunami quickly followed. And what happened next was the largest nuclear meltdown in the history of the world and the evacuation of 160,000 locals who lived in the area of the Fukushima power plant. We now know that Tokyo Electric, TEPCO, the owner of the Fukushima plant, had been warned years earlier about the dangers of an earthquake and a tsunami hitting that very plant. No one did anything about it then. But even if they had, do we have any reason to believe it would have been enough? Because that's the gamble that the Japanese nuclear industry is making with all of our futures right now. The simple fact about nuclear power generation is that the risks and the costs dramatically outweigh any benefit. We've seen some of the risks. In Chernobyl, we saw how human error can cause a meltdown. In the Three Mile Island incident, we saw how the private corporations aren't afraid to cut corners to pad their bottom line, even if that risks a partial nuclear meltdown. And in Fukushima, we saw what happens when corporate negligence meets a natural disaster. Considering nuclear power's track record and the staggering risks involved, it's amazing that anyone will insure nuclear projects. And the simple fact is that without government backing, like the Price-Anderson Act here in the United States, nuclear power would be impossible because no private insurance company will fully cover it. And to add insult to injury, nuclear power is actually not an alternative energy source. It's incredibly fossil fuel intensive in its processes. We can start with how much cement is required to contain and protect the reactors and other sensitive parts of the plant. Cement and concrete are hugely greenhouse gas intensive to produce. And the only way we know how to protect our power plants is to use more concrete. Beyond that, the size of the project requires tons of truckloads of materials being hauled in and away, adding to the toll of carbon costs. Even if we just look at the material inputs used in nuclear power, it is carbon intensive to mine uranium. It is carbon intensive to enrich uranium. And we still don't know what to do with all that nuclear waste. The reality is that there are economically viable and truly clean energy alternatives. Geothermal, solar, wind, tidal wave power. These are all options that Japan could be using right now. And they're options that have none of the risks and none of the costs associated with enriched radioactive material. And bringing those renewable options online, it's not nearly as costly in terms of carbon or in money, frankly, as it is to bring a nuclear power plant online. The reality is the only reason anyone wants to bring these nuclear power plants back online is that when for-profit companies like TEPCO run nuclear power with massive government subsidies and government paid for insurance, it can be hugely profitable. Nuclear power is not a bridge fuel. It is not a clean alternative, and it can't be our future. In the 1940s, scientists marveled at the idea of using fission to safely create large amounts of energy indefinitely, and they were wrong. The only reason we're clinging to that fantasy today is that the for-profit nuclear owners, think Montgomery Burns from The Simpsons, don't care about the cost of nuclear power to society. They'll happily sell the future of life on Earth just to make a buck today, which is why both Japan and the United States should just say no to nuclear power. And that's the way it is tonight, Tuesday, August 11th, 2015. And don't forget, democracy begins with you. Get out there, get active, tag, you're it. Fuck.
And the organizers of the Tokyo Olympics have again defended their logo against the claim of plagiarism. They revealed their original design and explained how it differs from a theater emblem in Belgium. Members of the Tokyo Organizing Committee described how Japanese art director Kenjiro Sano had created their logo. They said the red circle was originally in a different position at the bottom right, and they said the letter T was originally easier to recognize. They said Sano modified his design twice because checks of international trademarks revealed similarities. Belgian graphic designer Olivier Duby filed a lawsuit earlier this month in Belgium. He says Sano's logo is extremely similar to a theater logo he created two years ago. He's demanding the International Olympic Committee stop using Sano's design. The original design shows that the creation process makes it quite different from the Belgian theater logo. The Tokyo organizers say they regret the lawsuit was filed. They say they hope people now appreciate the thinking behind their logo. Japanese cabinet ministers have set a new cap on the price to build a national stadium for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics. They've scrapped the original plan amid criticism for the skyrocketing price tag. They say they'll now cut costs by 40 percent. We've limited the function of the new stadium to what is needed for the competitions. We considered what's best for the athletes and what would suit a main stadium for the 2020 Olympics and Paralympics. 
Cabinet ministers endorsed a new cap that limits construction costs to about $1.3 billion. The new stadium will have about 68,000 seats for the games. They can be increased to 80,000 if necessary for a World Cup soccer match. The stadium's roof will now only cover the upper seats, and a subtract for warm-ups will be built within walking distance from the stadium. The stadium is set for completion by the end of April 2020, but the International Olympic Committee requested it finished by January of that year. So the government will seek proposals from designers and construction firms to try to meet that date. Seventy years after the atomic bombing, people from around the world have come to Hiroshima to discuss how to achieve a world free of nuclear weapons. NHK World's Chie Yamagishi has more. The United Nations Conference on Disarmament Issues opened on Wednesday. It brought together 83 people from more than 20 countries, including government officials, experts and representatives of civil groups. At first, six panelists discussed how to realize a world without nuclear weapons. An atomic bomb survivor described his suffering and warned that further usage of these weapons would destroy humankind. I will never give up my efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons until my last breath. Some speakers said world leaders, including U.S. President Barack Obama, should visit to learn the reality of the bombing. I would be very pleased if President Obama came to Hiroshima and took the occasion to make a speech that, in a sense, he gave his Prague speech at the beginning of his administration. His Hiroshima speech could be at the end of his administration, reinforcing his view that nuclear weapons should be eliminated. Participants then visited the Peace Memorial Park. They offered prayers for those who lost their lives. They also listened to a survivor's testimony. Yoshiko Kajimoto said she injured her arms and so many people dying with their eyes or internal organs popping out. She also said many children died or suffered. The city was really hell. I don't want to see such horrible scenes again, and you should never watch that either. I hope no more people have to run away while stepping over dead bodies. The whole experience has been so profound. I have been so touched and so sad. We have to keep uh, her stories, uh, the legacies of uh, the eight bombs, so that uh, the future red generations would appreciate it and also to join efforts to, for a nuclear-free world. On day two, Participants discussed the outcome of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference this spring. Taos Feruki of Algeria, who chairs the conference, said there were differences over a proposed nuclear arms free zone in the Middle East. She said there was a lack of bridge builders. Feruki also proposed to set up a working group to consider effective measures for nuclear disarmament at the next session of the UN General Assembly. The NPT regime is really under stress. Renewed and determined efforts are required to bridge the gap between expectations and achievements. Another speaker called for a summit in Hiroshima so that world leaders can discuss nuclear disarmament face to face. Participants have learned what happened here 70 years ago. They renewed their ideas on how to press ahead with nuclear disarmament. Che Yamagishi, NHK World, Hiroshima. In Indonesia, a groundbreaking ceremony took place on Friday for the country's largest power plant. The nation has been suffering from severe power shortages. Tra Chirokosan in Bangkok has more. Tra, good evening. Good evening, James. The construction project has been delayed due to stalled talks with local residents over land acquisition. Indonesian President Joko Widodo stressed that the ceremony is proof that his government has started to address its infrastructure failings. NHK World's Yusuke Ota has more. The construction of the 2,000 megawatts coal fired power plant is set to start in Batang, central Jawa. When completed, 
it will be able to provide electricity for two million households. I hope this power plant will be a model for other projects involving foreign investment. A joint venture set up by Japan's Itochu and J-Power and Indonesia's Pete Adalo Energy will operate and build the plant. But the project has faced opposition from local farmers who refused to relocate. In Indonesia, mega development projects were pushed through, particularly by the government of the autocratic president Suharto. But now that the country is more democratized, authorities have no choice but to win the consent of local residents. Government officials say Friday's groundbreaking ceremony came about after negotiations with locals reached a point where compromise is likely. The Indonesian government showed it can tackle problems on its own. Foreign investors will not be so anxious. Indonesia, ASEAN's largest economy and most populous country, is undergoing rapid urbanization and industrialization. The government says Indonesia needs to build power plants with a total output of 35,000 megawatts over the next five years to resolve the pressing problem of worsening power shortages. Meanwhile, foreign investors have been demanding that the Indonesian government take measures to improve its investment environment. They are calling for the construction of more roads and power plants as well as official assistance for land acquisition for their businesses. Construction kick Japan has positioned infrastructure exports as part of its growth strategy. By bringing the Batam project to the start gate, President Joko Widodo's administration now appears to be sending a positive message to Japan and other overseas investors. Yusuke Ota, NHK World, Batan, Indonesia.